answer with Jesus' own identity and mission. I invite you to stand as you are able as you join together in confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from our Lord, when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected the word, but it made us in front of ourselves. We have failed to show us our conduct to those who call us to welcome, except for our enemies, the things we have done, and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and meet us. That we may be the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news in Christ Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted to the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life. Live as free, forgiven children of God. Amen.
seagull or climbing symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give, give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious to boast or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we have prophesied only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to child's way, childish ways. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide in these three, and the greatest of these is love. Word of God, word of God. Because the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, send me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that you have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of, a brow of the hill on which the town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. I'm going to name for you uh, some companies you probably have heard of, and you tell me what they are known for or what they make, what they're, what they're all about. All right? Krispy Kreme. Don't know. Yes. It's morning time. It's on my mind. Uh, Folgers. 
Very good. Good year. Well, oh, blimps would have been acceptable too, I guess. Nike? Shoes. Shoes, all right. Geico? Insurance. Insurance. The Green Bay Packers? <laughs> I, I would have said heartbreak. <laughs> well, well, good. The, the advertisers have done their job, and the names of so many of these companies are synonymous with the, the very thing they do or make. Of course, that gets a little more complicated, as many of these and others do more, they do much more than the thing they're primarily known for. When businesses seek to diversify what they do, that comes with some issues, mainly identity issues. When your favorite fast food place for lunch begins to make breakfast, well, there is some hesitation about trying that out. If Goodyear decided to not just make tires, but also to get involved with coffee, or if Super One started doing roofing projects, consumers would have some questions about that. This kind of diversification, widening the scope of what a company is and does, can be lucrative, but also muddies and, and dilutes identity so that we are no longer so quick to name what they do, what they make, what they are for. Now, if I were to have thrown out not the name of a company, but the name of a person, Jesus Christ, and asked what he is known for, or what he does, there would have been a bit of a lack of clarity in my answers, and perhaps some hesitation in answering we would have been forced to ponder, yeah, when it comes down to it, who is Jesus? What does he do? What is he for? Perhaps some of the pat answers would have come to us. Jesus is the, the Son of God, or the second person of the Trinity, or God in the flesh. Or maybe instead of who he is, we would have gone the what he does way, and, and say things like he, he dies for sinners, or he gives his life to forgive. He is raised from the dead to gift us with eternal life. Others might have said, Jesus creates welcoming community, or shows a new way to be a human being, or to threaten us with everlasting punishment so that we do good and be good. Not all of these responses are entirely off base, except maybe that last one, but what they reveal is a fundamental lack of clarity about Jesus. A lack of clarity that has come from years and years of reflection, of tradition, of theologizing, with the result being that if asked who or what Jesus is and does, we could not answer without searching our mental files for the most appropriate response. And we probably couldn't do it with the speed you demonstrated when asked about Folgers or In our gospel today, however, Jesus has a moment of self-definition, where he shares with those gathered in his hometown synagogue what he has come to do. Adopting the words of Isaiah, Jesus reads that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him so that he is anointed to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim God's year of favor, the jubilee year, when all debt is forgiven, and lands once parceled off are returned to their original tenants. It could be, that when the name of Jesus is mentioned, that, that these things came to mind. Certainly good news, release, recovery, freedom, and forgiveness of words we associate with Jesus. However, that these things are for the poor, incarcerated, blind, persecuted, and those drowning in debt might not have come to mind quickly or at all. There is a reason for that. As the community of Jesus' followers became more established over the first centuries of the church, it also became more allied and powerful. 
and the more culturally acceptable. Sure, it began as a movement with this narrow focus on the poor and downtrodden. But that was really too narrow, too focused, too exclusive, and too threatening to those powerful people and cultural forms that needed people to remain poor, in debt, behind bars, oppressed. So the understanding of Jesus' identity and mission came to be spoken of in more spiritual terms, in ways more removed from daily life. Forgiveness was for moral feelings, for errors of judgment, not debt cancellation. Good news for the poor is for anyone who lacks anything at all. Release for the captives is not for prisoners, but everyone who is held in bondage to sin, to actions that offend the public order. Aren't we all oppressed by something? There is freedom in Jesus for those who are weighed down by guilt and shame. But Jesus announced in the synagogue that day isn't rejected outright like it was by some of his hearers who immediately tried to throw him off the cliff, but was instead expanded so as to make it more acceptable to the powerful who needed to maintain the world in a certain way that benefited them. The internalizing of these things, the making recovery and release of our emotions and hearts and minds and spirits, expanded the good news of Jesus to the masses, but also money up any clarity about who Jesus is and what he is about. The synagogue orders begin with speaking well of Jesus when he shares his mission with them, what he is to be about his self-definition. But then the conversation continued. Jesus clarifies who he is and what he is to be about, and that it will not be for the hometown crowd, but for those beyond the boundaries, the hungry widows of Sidon and Syrian lepers, the suffering ones of foreign lands and enemy nations. Thrown into a rage over this revelation, his hometown well-wishers take him to the nearest hill so as to dispatch him. If he is not for them, he won't be for anybody at all. So we have two reactions to who Jesus says he is and what he is for. He can be gotten rid of, or he can be redefined. If he is to be for those we do not wish him to be for, he can be killed off, and thus we deprive our enemies of the good he would bring them. Or he can be understood in a different way through years of theology and tradition that would make him anew as one whose generality, whose diversified mission, expands its approval and acceptance of even those who oppress, who imprison, who exploit, and who hold the debt. Now, in our time and place, these words of Scripture and this redefinition of Jesus have come to us. We have been well trained to think of ourselves as poor, blind, oppressed in some way, so as to make these words about us rather than about others. Yet Jesus' self definition and his redefinition also come to us at a time and place when fewer and fewer people want anything to do with Jesus or the church. The spiritualizing of who Jesus is, the generalizing of what he does, has put him out of touch with suffering and has more often than not put him on the side of the powerful and violent ones inflicting suffering. Souls are what are cared for, not stomachs. Spiritual conditions, not financial states. Religious dispositions and church affiliations, not health and safety. Newer generations are seen through the charade and are coming to see themselves like the young prophet Jeremiah, who we heard was tasked with plucking and pulling 
destroying and overthrowing. The church has played into all this, redirecting attention to the invisible and heavenly rather than the earthly and visible, engaging in morality policing and political influencing. At times, it has believed itself to be a gathering of folks whose purpose is to preserve an ethnically specific heritage or to be a society of, a, of building maintenance or to be a social club or to be an hour of entertainment with good music and a humorous pastor. Ask a church goer what the identity and mission of a congregation is. And just like with Jesus, there will be a lack of clarity about who the church is and what it is for. This morning, however, perhaps every time we get together for worship or service of neighbor, we are reminded that in baptism, at this table, in the stories of scripture and in song, we are gifted with the identity and mission of Jesus. When Jesus says he is about good news for the poor, sight for the blind, freedom from oppression, release of captives, and cancellation of debt, we find in his self-definition our own calling and purpose. Which is to say that these ones and these things are to be our focus and concern. The real world, on the ground, specificity of this strikes us as scandalous. As just too political for our liking. So we are confronted further with our identity and mission. It is not about us, but others. The widows and lepers. The other people from other places. Hearing this like hometown synagogue goers some time ago, we are faced with a crisis. Might we dare adopt Jesus' self-definition as our own? Might we receive the gift of it? Might we find the courage to cast off centuries of redefining Jesus and church to be about so many other things? And to begin to think of ourselves in this congregation as existing for others? Or will we make it about us? Find a way to recategorize my middle class life as poverty, or to understand oppression as the inconvenience that Wednesdays and Sundays are no longer church days in our community? Or will we muster up a mob and try to chase Jesus off the cliff? Because we can't have him as the one who has been anointed for others, who goes to foreign widows and generals, who sets criminals free, and leads us into such socially unacceptable activities. When we come to embrace Jesus' ministry and calling as our own, when we discover Jesus' self-definition is somehow belonging to us, we begin to understand who we are and what we are for. A clarity of identities experienced a unity of purpose is known. The church rediscovers its mission as a community that exists for others, that works with the victims of this world's violences and hatreds, and tries to be good news and release and freedom for others. The church is able to sort out what it is for, and knowing who it is, it can break foreign borders, barbed wire defenses, and cliff edges as it fulfills its mission. As we become centered again in this identity, knowing who we are, what we are for, the world around us, our wider community, will notice, and church will be redefined for them. Perhaps they will find that they have partners in the cause of justice and peace they didn't know they have. Perhaps they will find a presence accompanying them in their suffering rather than people trying to sort them out into saved or damned, or trying to convince them to believe unbelievable things. They will know glad tidings, redemption, and release coming from a source 
they were sure sold a different product. And they will find it coming from you and me. This congregation and from Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
You are the refuge of uh, all who seek a hope and freedom, a company of immigrants and refugees, and asylum seekers who cross borders to find safety and opportunities, embolden leaders to draft compassionate policies on behalf of migrants and uh, those who assist them. God of grace. Yeah. Love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Comfort with your love, all who are lonely, fearful, or brokenhearted. Sustain the hope of all these who suffer in body or spirit. We pray especially for Marcia Pearson, Sonny Foley, Gary Williams, Cassie Reed, Granta Owen, Katie Roper, Carrie Birdseye Erickson, Tim Bell, Al Johnson, Jamie Desimone, Ann Holochek, Clyde Erickson, Sue Malley, Patty Pearson, Kalina Denny, Helena Williams, Roger Erickson, John Sandino, Beverly Hoppy, Ellen Clark, Philip Hedges, and those who need our hearts. Grant them healing and wholeness. God of grace. Your grace falls upon the young and old alike. Bless the gifts of children in this congregation and in this community. Give us humble hearts to follow with your leadership. Inspire us with your laughter, your insight, and your curiosity. God of grace. We, we praise you for those who have gone before us and now see you, you face to face. Abide with us in this mortal life and help me rest in the arms of your never ending love. Grace. Since we have such great hope in your promises of God, we lift these in all our prayers to you with confidence and faith. For Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare for our time of holy communion, we sing together in the Lord.
together. Give thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we praise Jesus for us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Come to God's table, there is a place for you and enough for all.
body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, for your sins, and keep us in His grace. Amen. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened with the richness of your grace, your Son Jesus Christ. Amen. God, who leads you in paths of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forevermore. Amen.